You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 12, cutie pie. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for people who have careers in the circus industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information with the community, and for outsiders to get a backstage glance into our world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. Today's show is about the intersection of circus and social media, and my guest is the definitely internet famous Brandon Scott, acrobat. Brandon has the traditional resume of a young professional aerialist, trained high-level gymnastics at a young age, discovered aerial arts in college, and then moved to Las Vegas to pursue making a full-time career as a circus artist. What makes Brandon different is during his journey, he has built up a following of over 56,000 thousand people on his Instagram account and has flown all over the world to teach and judge aerial competitions. In this interview, I talked to Brandon about how he got started, his views on the world of social media, and what tips he has for the rest of us to grow our accounts. Here's my interview with Brandon Scott, Acrobat. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Good. It's so cool to hear your voice. <laughs> I I know it's so funny because since I've been listening to the previous episodes of your podcast, it's like listening to your podcast. But now you're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually me. You can talk back yeah. and I'll answer. <laughs> and you'll answer. I know it's magic. Welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast, Brendan Scott Acrobat. Thank you. <laughs> Do you go by Brandon Scott? I guess technically Brandon Scott is my stage name, but it's my first and middle name. I know yeah. a lot of people who do that, actually. So yeah, totally. Like double name. It's nice. It's nice to have a just like a little bit of separation between your like your brand and yourself. You know. I mean, I'm trying to know more and more. <laughs> it's funny because my brand is like totally different than my name, so totally. I feel like I can kind of be like, I'm Shannon of the Artist Athlete. When did you start thinking about the whole brand thing? Did that come on pretty early? No, that that actually came around the time that I was really getting into Instagram. I know that you kind of want to talk about that. Yeah. At some point today. I don't know if you want to like mix it up. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, we should do this. <laughs> but... <laughs> we should start at the beginning. So Let's start at the beginning. Tell the people at home who you are, what you do. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um <laughs> I'm Brandon. I do silk. <laughs> you probably have seen silks, but I do a lot of kind of acrobatics, um, uh, straps, hammock, loops. I do a little bit of Lyra with my friend Mandy, rope, and I mean, I'll pretty much plan anything. At Trappies Las Vegas, we used to have a welder in-house, so he also made a bunch of unique apparatus that I got to plan while I lived in Vegas. So. Oh, that's cool. And then with a background in gymnastics, I also tumble a little bit and do hand balancing. And Yeah, actually, that's yeah. something I really wanted to ask you about because I'm a huge Coach Summer fan. I'm a huge gymnastics body oh, fan. Yeah. Oh, um, sweet. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Could you explain for the people at home a little bit about his work and your connection to him? Coach Summer is, well, I mean, I know him as Coach Chris, but uh, <laughs> he awesome. actually was my gymnastics coach as a child. So I trained with him from the time I was nine until I was 15. And he is a junior Olympic coach. So he was able to create a lot of really stellar athletes as a coach. But during the time that I was with him, he started to transition into into something else. What ended up happening was he ended up kind of creating, well, he ended up first writing a book. And then that going through that process ended up leading him to creating a whole online gymnastics core system for adults in, in particular. Um, so that is gymnastic bodies. It is adult focused. It is comprehensive. There are so many um, exercises on there for strength and mobility. Um, but yeah, so I'm kind of one of the last gymnasts to come from Christopher Summer's actual like youth 
gymnastic training. Was it, is his training with you when you had that experience? Did you mm-hmm. find it at all similar to his gymnastics bodies programs? I, I think that the main difference is that when when he was a gymnastics coach, he was like a lot more grumpy. <laughs> 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 I think that, I think that just that kind of realm where you're Mm -hmm. like, where you're like working towards something like all year long and then have like a season where you're like, like on it, on it, on it. Um, I think that that is really stressful way to live and like structure your year. So I think that now that he's taken a step back and is able to like have a lot more flexibility that he's just like a happier person and so all the times that I've trained with Coach Chris as an adult, he's been like super relaxed, really engaging, and um, and everybody loves Coach Chris now. That was not necessarily the case when I was a child. Oh, that's so interesting. Because <laughs> I always hear him on podcasts and stuff, and I'm like, this guy yeah. sounds so chill. Like, he sounds cool. Yeah, not how it was back in the day. Wow. Do you ever apply or do you have any um, of his exercises that you think are particularly good for aerial work? I mean, to be honest, I feel like gymnastic bodies as a whole is super complimentary. Yeah, um, I agree. I, mean, I, have a, I have a little bit of a different perspective because it is literally the foundation of my physical like movement. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely, I definitely have a lot of respect for his method. I feel like I had a really big head start when I entered the aerial world because I had a good foundation of flexibility and strength and pike compression and awareness of my body. I guess I'm a little bit biased, but I think (laughs) gymnastic bodies is an awesome program. Yeah, I do too. I also think they should send us some money for like, (laughs) promoting them so hard right now but it is a really great program for people yeah well back to you brandon uh it says in your bio that you walked into an aerial silks class and like fell in love immediately can you Uh, talk a little bit more yeah and it's so funny because i'm actually in that room right now really (laughs) Uh uh-huh yeah i'm i'm at the studio right now at aries in sandy it's my my home studio and the studio that i am currently teaching at because I moved back to Salt Lake. I actually went and saw Aries' first recital as like a studio here and was Can like... Can you spell it? A... How do you e- spell it? Yeah, it's A-E-R-I-S, like Ariel, but Aries. Okay. Uh-huh. Got it. And it's in Salt Lake City, Utah. And Yeah, and just south of Salt Lake and Sandy. Okay, cool. Um, but yes, uh, I went and saw their first recital, and then I was like, that looks super fun. I want to do that. And then I went and took my first class, and well, I guess kind of some background is that after quitting, quitting gymnastics, I went into more music during high school. So I quit gymnastics when I was 15. In high school, I I had already played French horn and piano for several years, and I got into choir, and then into show choir, and then into musicals while I was in high school. So that's what I ended up coming to Utah to study, was musical theater. And then, yeah, I basically took my first those class and decided pretty much immediately to drop out of university (laughs) because I was like, musical theater is cool but I felt like Ariel was where my athletic and my musical talents came together and it was what I had spent my life preparing for I like knew it immediately so then what happened you just were like Uh, see you later squares and yeah well I mean left the program yeah I mean there were a couple other um it was the right time for me to leave sure um yeah I I basically finished out the school year (laughs) I told my parents, hey, so I'm dropping out. <laughs> Want to like do this circus thing. And they're like, cool, cool, cool. But how are you going to make money? <laughs> so I ended up compromising with them and doing a year of massage school um, after leaving university. So in conjunction with my aerial training, which I was doing basically full time, mm-hmm. I was going to massage school, which I think was was a really awesome decision. Um, I'm really glad that my parents pushed me 
to do that, I learned so much more about like anatomy and physiology, about how my body actually worked. I got worked. I got actual body work all the time when I was first starting Ariel, which was also just like sweet. So uh, I'm really happy that I did that. I ended up proving them wrong a little bit just because now I'm currently making all of my money doing Ariel, you know, so it's not like maybe I could have made it on this wild dream that I had, but I am really thankful for that extra little bit of education that I got. Do you ever practice massage? Every once in a while. In Utah, I was making the majority of my income doing massage and then like Ariel was like my like supplemental income. And my goal when I was moving to Vegas was to switch that. So to make Ariel my like main income and to have massages like my side income. And then it got to a point where I just didn't really need to do massage. So how long um, did you train in Utah before moving to Vegas? I trained here at Aries for two and a half years. And then I lived in Vegas for almost two and a half years. So I, I celebrated my five-year aerial anniversary in January. Well, congratulations. And did you move to Vegas for a contract or did you just decide that that was the place to go? No, yeah. I mean, I I guess I kind of felt like a uh, big fish in a small pond. Mm -hmm. um, by the time that I had, I kind of completed my education at Aries, where I, I learned silk straps and like high flexibility. I don't consider myself a contortionist, but um, high flexibility from Darla. And once I had kind of covered those bases and like felt like I had learned what I uh, needed to from her, then I felt like it was time to expand and like get a lot of just further my training, train with other people, train other things. You know, I had been with it, literally exclusive to one school for that whole time, that whole two and a half years. So it was good to get to another place. And Vegas is kind of in between Salt Lake and Phoenix, where, where I grew up and where basically circus is in the Southwest U.S. at least. Yeah, so I don't know. I've lived all over the U.S. and I've been a part of a lot of different circus scenes, but I don't really know the scene in Vegas. I know it's a great place for jobs. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of supply, I guess, but there's a equal, if not higher, demand. Mm. Or I, I guess I switched those two. So there's a big demand for for acrobats, but there's also a huge supply. That's that's what yeah. it is. Oh no, so, it makes. I feel like it makes it, sense either way, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess. I, yeah, it, either way that you think about it, I guess. But um, <laughs> there's a lot of there's, jobs. There's a lot of acrobats. There's a okay. lot of acrobats. There's a lot of really, really high level acrobats. So mm -hmm. it's a gr it's a great place to train because there is so much knowledge all in one place, you know. And it's a great place to be inspired too because there's so many acrobatic shows to go see. There's there's so many people like if you just like go into Loracle, just watch people, you're going to be inspired, you know, um, sure. and there's and there's so many co excellent coaches to train with. Um, so it's a great place to be a student for sure. For work, it is very competitive. Did you work a lot in Vegas? I guess quite, a lot quite. is a relative term. But yeah. So yeah. what was your Vegas? I coached time? quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing uh, I mean, I've been doing freelance work since the time that I started performing. So I did do events here and there on the strip and around town. But actually, I did the majority of my performing was either traveling or international. So and Were you with an agency in Vegas that would hire you out? No, actually, the vast majority of my work has been gotten through Instagram. So I should I should be way better about doing that connecting with with an agency i i know it's i mean I, you don't have to pay I, a percentage if it's through instagram so it's I don't know. that's that's totally true it's true. <laughs> um and and to be honest instagram has been very kind to me yeah you have now what fifty six thousand followers All, almost to 60 i'm at like 59 are point, you serious yeah 59.2 59.3 it like bounces back and forth the last few days Okay, so let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> let's get down to what's really on my mind. Okay. Uh, how did you do that, Brandon Scott Acrobat? Um, so I started training at Aries. I was doing massage as well at the time in Utah. 
Um, uh-huh. But so when I first started my Instagram, it was Brandon Scott Wellness. Mm-hmm. And so I was I was posting like stuff from all that kind of realm, you know, like my massage table, sometimes crystals, food, and then like... So it was more like an account dedicated to like a holistic wellness. Totally. That's, that's like Got what it. I like started out, started mm-hmm. out doing. Um, and so I did that for about six months. And then once I got to a thousand followers, I, that is when I made this decision to rebrand. I renamed my handle to Brandon Scott Acrobat. And I decided to post only acrobatic. And I made the goal to post one time every day. That was like the big three of when this ride really started. And what year was this? So that was, that was 2014 was, it was, it was literally January, just over four years ago. Once I started posting once a day, only acrobatic, then the snowball started to roll. Right. I, uh, I think I got to like 10,000 in that first year after. So I, it had taken me six months to get from zero to a thousand. And then it took me one year to get from one to 10,000. Right. Okay. And then, and then the next year I went from one to, or from 10 to 25. And then the next year I went from 25 to 50. And since, since I got to there, um, it has slowed down a lot for me. I worried for a little while that it was the way that Instagram itself was changing, that my following had started to slow down. But talking with um, Dara of Aerial Design, mm-hmm. um, we, we actually think that we're just kind of coming to the edge of the acrobatic interest on Instagram, you know. Um, I always wonder what that peak is. Totally. Well, Where do you cap out? Like Womack and Bowman is is doing really good. They're at like 75,000. There's also like just adjacent niches to us that are really big. Like the pole niche is like super gigantic. So if you can like, like stick, like have one foot in one and one in the other, I think that there is a bigger range for you. Also like the hand balancing kind of yoga community is gigantic, right? So if you can. Yeah. I also feel like you have like a flexibility niche. Yeah, maybe going on yeah. maybe there is a little bit of that too but and also lira lira is kind of its own its own little niche too that i don't think that i really have access to because i mostly post f- a vertical apparatus but yeah i mean really is just like about that consistency and yeah like just posting aerial trying to post once a day and then just like being friends with people on the app you know yeah <laughs> You're so you must be on it all the time because I feel like whenever I post like I like you're one of the first people I see like liking it and I'm like oh, wow he's- you call me out I know well that I mean it's true that you have to use the app in order to make it function correctly yeah um, totally I'm gonna ask a totally selfish question my content is mostly training tips it's helping people out no your um, content's awesome oh thank you. But I only follow like friends and French bulldogs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this, uh, I mean, I guess it's it's an My interesting confession. question. I know, I know, <laughs> animal. It's an interesting question. I think that the more that you follow acrobats, the more that acrobatics will show up in your feed, and then it becomes really passive because if you're just going through liking every Silks post that you see, then those people are seeing that you're interacting and will come back to follow you. Do you know what I'm saying? So if, yeah. if you're, if you have all bulldogs in your feed and you're an acrobatic account and you're giving your, <laughs> your little hearts away to all the bulldogs, those people are less likely to look at your account and say, Oh, that's something that interests me. And so that's not really your market. Right. So you right. can definitely like do that for your own, like fun and entertainment because I'm, I definitely have like niches that I like to, I like to have on my Instagram feed as well. But if you're looking to grow your Instagram, I would suggest that you are following the people that you would want to follow you, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. This podcast is brought to you by The Artist Athlete. Did you know that The Artist Athlete is more than just a podcast? It's a growing online resource for students of the aerial arts 
to deepen their journey to badassery by accessing techniques approved by physical therapists and master coaches in the industry. Our current spotlight is on the Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment, a practical manual for hanging upside down. This online manual is a step-by-step -step guide. It is complete with photos, videos, and exercises that you can implement immediately to help you gain the strength and awareness you need for an aerial practice that promotes shoulder health and longevity and good posture upright so you don't walk around like a gorilla. But don't just take my word for it. Here's circus physical therapist Dr. Jen Crane of Cirque Physio to tell you more. The fundamentals of aerial alignment is an absolute must-have for every aerialist of every level. I can't even tell you how many shoulder injuries I treat that are a direct result of rushing past the basics and attempt to get a trick too soon. In the manual, Shannon deconstructs the fundamentals, including the correct muscular engagement to safely arrive in these positions and the rationale for why it matters. Of course, in addition to all of these fabulous pearls of wisdom, the book is also ridiculously fun to read. It's been lovingly garnished with the Shannon humor we all know and love. Thanks, Jen. Cirque Physio is also featured in the book to give scientific insight into why it all works. Pick up your copy today by going to theartistathlete.com and clicking e-manuals. Listeners of the podcast can get a 10% discount by typing in the offer code podcast at checkout. Again, that's theartistathlete.com, offer code podcast. Now, back to the show. I have, a, I have a question, and I didn't send this one to you, but it's yeah. something that comes up a lot. And I don't know if you discuss this maybe with Dara or other people about how much oh, do Dara. you feel? I'm sorry, Dara. I've Dara, never met her. I, feel like I know, I know. And when you when you see your name on on Instagram, it's just D A R A, and yeah. and it's everyone always says Dara, and her name is Dara, like Sarah, and okay. And yeah, she's so awesome too. So if you ever have a chance to meet her, definitely. How much do you guys though kind of monitor your content for people out there who watch it and may not be ready to try it? Or how much do you restrict Ooh. your exposure? Mm -hmm. Do you know the, that's a terrible way of asking that I, question. No, but... no, no. I, I totally understand what you're saying. And it's, um, it's something that like weighs my mind a lot. It's something that I've actually posted about in the safety and aerial arts group, which is funny yeah. that that group comes up again in another podcast. It's an awesome group, but yeah. I do think about this a lot. I mean, mainly, mainly what I try to do is I try not to post the entrances to drops just because I feel like they're the most inherently dangerous mm -hmm. part of aerial. Um, and, and it's hard to no subtleties from watching a video but a lot of times even like really dangerous drops can have really easy to follow rap so i try and restrict that and then the, the other the other thing that i do is i just try and execute things at such a high level that beginners will try it and just be like nope <laughs> like, <laughs> can't do that so those are like the two things that I kind of use to restrict but otherwise people especially adults have to be um, self-aware don't show entrances to things that you feel are incredibly dangerous yeah or do things that are so difficult that the people who shouldn't be doing yeah. them just won't physically be able to just, do them exactly yeah yes yeah, yeah it's funny and that's also that's also a good way to get admirers at least students who then will remember that and then when you're in town will be like oh like I really want to train with that person because I want to learn that thing that they did on Instagram but that I could never teach myself how do you how many dms do you get a day actually it used to be a lot more I feel like it's slowed down pretty much it depends on where I am if I'm traveling internationally and I'm like advertising that then yeah. I will get like so many per day and it's good like people asking questions about classes and like relevant stuff so that's all nice but it it fluctuates you know I that question is actually from Jen Crane of Cirque Physio because oh, she's yeah? at like 25k yeah and she, I was like is there anything you want me to ask Brandon Scott Acrobat and she was like <laughs> yeah how does he deal with his inbox <gasps> Uh, I think also because she's a physio, people I come think, to her with pretty complex true. problems. I think that's true. I I think that the way that you kind of brand yourself can can make your inbox explode, mm, <laughs> right? I think. I mean, yeah. even with 
even with you, since your content is a little bit more like educational based, do you find that you get a lot of questioners? No, I get I get a lot of thank yous, which are really nice and really easy to respond to because it's generally like, thank you, I've never thought of it that way or like, that's something I'm going to incorporate in my teaching. Or I get pictures of people who have done what I've kind of cued them to do and are like, this totally works now. Oh, but that's awesome. I know, it's really Those awesome. Are Those are fun DMs. I know, it makes me I really get, happy. I get a wide variety of, of things. A lot of, a lot of just like random questions. I was working for Aerial Essentials while I lived in Vegas. And so when I um, advertise for Aerial Essentials, I generally get a lot of questions about equipment, which is cool. I, I like that. And I get a little kickback if you use the code Brandon at checkout at Aerial Essentials. So um, ah. there's, there's, my, there's my little plug. Aerial Essentials. Yeah, I, I actually love their stuff. So I'm totally yeah, cool with that. It's super, super high quality stuff. The like workers, the people who are packing your boxes all are aerialists. So it's a really cool company to support because you're literally that's how that was my day job when I lived in Vegas was Aerial Essentials. So like you were helping me to work. So I don't know. That's that's kind of cool. It's like small business minded and actual aerialists instead of just like Grunt and it was her. founded by a circus artist, right? Oh, Cheetah's, yeah. 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 Cheetah Plaz. Um, yeah, he's been doing circus for a long time. He's got a lot, a lot of acro experience and a lot of aerial experience as well. Do you find Instagram has helped your performing career? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the gigs that I have gotten has been through Instagram. It's been literally people either DMing me through Instagram or going to my email through my Instagram to inquire. So, I mean, it's the bedrock of <laughs> my freelance performing, at least. What's the craziest request you've ever gotten? To come to my... Aerial-wise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, okay, one time, well, okay, this is actually the craziest one. When I went to Thailand last year, I went in like mm. August, and so I like flew all the way over there. I was judging a competition and teaching workshops in privates while I was there. And once I got into the country, I had a girl named Oksana who reached out to me and was like, hey, I do like five nights a week uh, performing silks at this nightclub in Phuket and I like already talked to my manager and if you can make your way down here then I'll like give you my my gig for the night basically so I just I had to just like figure out my schedule whether or not I could do this flight and get myself down there and I ended up working it out but it was after my workshops for the day, I ended up taking the flight between like 9 and 11 o'clock at night, getting to my hotel where I could hang out for a minute this the, this whole time on the flight and in my hotel, choreographing, literally, then going to the nightclub, doing a one o'clock set the first time I had run through this choreography oh my God. in front of people. And then and it all worked out. Super cool. <laughs> it was in a really high, high space. So okay. it, it was bigger than anything that I regularly perform on. And and also I was, it, since it was a nightclub, I had chosen like a nightclub-esque song, you know, which is usually it's like corporate, corporate gigs. So I was using music that I had never done aerial to before, as well as um, oh, fun. In, in a new space, no rehearsal time. You oh know, my God, that's that's cool that you said yes to it, though. Yeah. You have to. Yeah, I was, like. I was like, I guess I'm already here in Thailand. Like, it's now or never, basically. <laughs> I mean, uh, hopefully I'll be back sometime. Yeah, Thailand's definitely on my bucket list, for sure. I've got, I've got some things coming up that hopefully will bring me there. I've been going to South America really often, and there are so many especially silk artists there. I've heard Argentina is amazing. For Argentina silks. is amazing. Oh, I love Argentina. The first time that I went there, I judged the very first um, national Argentine competition. And then I went back last year to judge it again. And basically, like, everything I had taught the year before, like, these acrobats were, like, executing at such a higher level than the year before. <laughs> yeah. And they, they are just, like, super hard workers, really enthusiastic. I love Argentina. How do you judge an aerial competition? Mm, that is a good question. It's actually not really stressful, but is really taxing because 
you're watching so many routines and depending on the competition just wherever that you are there are like local things that are just like widespread through that community of aerial so you like you mean like skills or tricks to- like sequences mm-hmm. yeah that, like yeah. really really common to that community so you like start to see that that like pattern pop up and depending on how many it is it can be really hard to give your full focus to that for such a long time because most of the competitions that I've done have run literally all day so from like oh my god 10 10 a.m to 10 p.m oh my gosh yeah yeah I've judged one competition in Texas Mm -hmm, and it was really it was like there were 10 people because it was part of a pole convention but they had just added silks and hoop and they were like we need aerialists to judge it and it was really hard because well for me personally like I don't really see aerial as a sport totally so it was like there was no rubric or there was no way for me to sit there. I mean, I could say like, that looks really dangerous when you do that or that was really cool transition I've never seen before. The ones that you've judged, how many have you judged? Um, let's see. I've done two in Mexico, two in Argentina, Thailand. So that's probably five. And I'm going to Ecuador in um, July for another competition. Oh my God, how fun. Yeah, so five so far. And do um, they provide rubrics for the judges? Um, Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you, always, you always get like a sheet of at least the different categories categories and the different competitions will have them broken down a little differently. Actually, the competition in Argentina was the most interesting to me because they had each judge judging something different. So the first year that I was there, I was technical one. So I was basically like the overview judge. Oh, I see. So your job was like just to judge their technique. Yes, basically just technique. And then there was a technical two judge that had even more specific Specific technique that they were looking for, right? So they had bonuses that you can execute for like extra points. So like technical two judge. Actually, no, I think technical two had more specific, but that there was even just a judge looking for like bonuses and deductions. And then there were two artistic judges. So two people just focusing on the artistic. Wait a second, what would you get a deduction for? Um, for, for poor form, for, yeah, just like your basic, like, gymnastics deductions, too. Um, oh, my God, that's so interesting. But, so, then, do they have, I mean, like, I literally know nothing about this world. Do they have different values? Would a straight arm inversion be valued mm-hmm, different than no, a bent arm inversion? No, no, or no, how no, do they, that, like... no, the, um... That kind of goes into, I guess, the how good the eye of the technical judges are. Okay. As to, like differentiating between that for this like kind of breakdown of the skill that I'm talking about. They had very specific skills that you could get bonuses on. So this was roll ups, balance splits. They had, then that person also did deductions, just basic deductions on your everyday skills. And then there were two judges that were just focusing on the artistic aspects. And all together, then those scores were combined and averaged out and that's how they were ranked at the end something i'm really trying to explore on the podcast is what is circus and like where is it going or what are people doing with it totally and this whole world of championships or kind of making it into sport takes it into a really different realm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's there's definitely discussion to be had about the nature of competition for aerial, what place it, it really even has the community. I mean, having been on both sides, I feel like that it's a good way to like create a milestone for yourself, right? As a as a performer, you're like, I'm gonna enter this competition. I like I'm going to like work really hard in preparation for it. I'm going to like put this routine together for someone who's a student and who isn't performing regularly. Like that's such a great goal creator. You know what I mean? And I think that if you view it more like that, as like an opportunity rather than a place to stack yourself up against your peer students. I feel like that's where it can get a little bit less productive if you're like using it to like show that you're you're better than the other kids in your class, you know? Because especially in these international places, the competition is set up for like the community to be brought together, right? All the local studios to like come together in a place. Oh, I love that. So it's like, like a recital or a... Yeah, like like 
a uh, performance, it's, but kind of under a competitive guise. Totally, totally. Almost. That's I would I would agree with that last that last judgment, which is which is really fun. There's something you said that was really interesting earlier when you were talking about performing in Thailand and how you were choreographing and you were saying how what you were making was more for a club scene versus a corporate gig. Mm -hmm. When you did the U.S. Aerial Championship, did you tailor a performance that was different than what you would do for a corporate gig? I mean, I definitely feel like I have kind of a specific style. And to be honest, I really perform for me first. So Mm. I choose music that I like. I do skills that I like to perform. I guess I hope that the people watching enjoy it too. But I do change it a little bit depending on the audience. But my niche, I guess, is pop music, pretty lines, and me hooks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh my god we have the same niche i, I love meat hooks pretty lines of pop music i know it's so funny <laughs> that's great though you're talking i mean i think that this is the interesting kind of issue or thing when people are trying to create things so often you see like instrumental music mm-hmm. and these moody pieces because totally and i remember for a really long time being like oh i have to have an instrumental piece in a white unitard and <laughs> do a bunch of splits because that's what the people want even though i was so bored doing it Totally. And I started out doing all instrumental too. Really where I found my kind of performance tastes is from from videoing myself over and over and over and over and over again for Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially especially once they introduced the minute long Instagram videos and I started putting up actual choreography. I was watching myself. I was creating so much content and watching myself so often that I developed a taste for what movement quality I really liked and what I liked to move to and what people responded to as well, you know? So yeah, I mean, Instagram definitely kind of influenced that part of me as well. Instagram is integral to your creative process. Integral, (laughs) totally. Well, and just that kind of in that same wavelength, um, is integral to my training process at the beginning too because once I made that goal to post once a day, I like had to create enough content to post once a day. <laughs> which Oh yeah. Which, Tell me which about it. Means that you have <laughs> to have to be training. And I feel like it actually developed a lot of really good habits for me to make that goal and execute it. You know? That's super cool. Yeah. Um, no, I love that. And definitely resonate. I feel like I sometimes get worried that I'll be at the end of it. I hold back a bit or I'm like, oh, I'm not going to post that yet because mm-hmm. what if I run out of ideas? But actually, like the sooner I post the idea that I immediately have, the more ideas I have. Totally, totally. I feel that too. I love this idea, though, of Instagram as a means of artistic inspiration. Totally. I mean, it's de- almost like you have this whole virtual community of collaborators. And like friends and training partners. Dara and I knew each each other like for so long before we met last year and then it was just like stepping right into our friendship that I think has come over and over and over in the time that I started actually like traveling with an Instagram following is like suddenly all these virtual friendships just materialize suddenly (laughs) (laughs) funny Well, it's so weird also that people, like even you being like, you've been in Europe for a while. I'm like, how do you know that? Because I like forget. I'm like, I know. It's just like so easy so to just weird. like casually stalk everyone else. How do, you, how do you discern what you put out there and what you don't? Or do you? Like I said, I guess I keep that one little barrier by like not using my last name on my handle. In terms of actual aerial content, there are sequences that I've created that I've never posted. There's techniques that Mm. are mine Mm -hmm. that I don't put out onto the internet or I post like it from the middle where nobody could ever like make their way to the beginning of that video because I made up the first three steps and I'm posting it from step four, you know? Mm -hmm. So they're, I don't know, kind of a way that I have some discretion in terms of posting but honestly the more generous that I have been with the content that I posted the more people respond positively to it so (laughs) you're the second person who I've been like this is a silly question to ask because I also feel like with you I had Doug Stewart on who's around 23 or so and just started a circus company touring Mm. wow producing a touring yeah he's 23 
Uh, dumb. Yeah, he just graduated from college and he's toying around with the, his own circus company. I'm like, you nerd. <laughs> you like overachieving nerd. Yeah. But I feel similarly about you. Like to ask the question, what advice would you give at the beginning of your career? Oh, yeah. No, that I mean, it is kind of funny because I do feel like <laughs> s- still so much of a student and I have so much more growth to do. But since you had sent this question previously, I actually was thinking about all the way back to when I was a gymnast, what I would tell myself. Mm, okay. And and there were two things. The first one is that when I was a gymnast, I was plagued by anxiety when I would go to competition. And now being a performer, I wish that I could go back and tell my younger self to view those competitions more as a performance and view my the execution of my routines as for myself and for the like parents in the stands rather than for Hmm. the judge I trained for myself for sure but then once I would get to competition I just like wouldn't be able to eat I'd just be like so much anxiety it's not like I even really cared like the placement that I got I just did not enjoy myself you know and I feel like I would have enjoyed it a lot better if I would have performed it instead of competed it. The thing that I would tell myself when I quit gymnastics was this is not the peak of your athleticism. Because at the time, that is what I thought. I was like, when am I ever going to be in the same shape as I am as a teenage boy as in competitive gymnastics? You know, like this is the peak. Like that's just, I was just resigned to it. (laughs) And now as a person who is far stronger and far more flexible than I was at that time. I just want to give that past self the reassurance that you can always keep progressing, especially if it's something that you love. There's so much more time and there's so much more to learn and there's so much more growth to be had. Hell yeah. It's so true. At any point in your life. No, and this is like the great, one of the great lies of society, this idea that like, once you hit 20, your body completely falls apart and you can't do anything ever again. Uh, Totally. It's just such a, I mean, Philip, I I don't know if you listen, how much of the podcast you listen to, but my friend Philip is a contortionist who just started working on his Marinelli bend again. He's like, says the same thing at 43. He's like, I'm doing Marinelli bends. I'm more flexible than I ever have been. Oh, that's so inspiring. I know. I know. I'm like, okay, cool. (laughs) Okay, cool. (laughs) Would you rather be able to speak every language or talk to a species of animal? I... So, like, you could talk to all humans or you could talk to, like, all birds. Love animals, so I so, like, want to be just, like, super fanciful and choose that one. But practically, it would be so, 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 so nice to be able to teach all my international students in their language. So I would definitely have to choose that one. Oh, my gosh. You're so kind. Oh, uh, what a... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... What an altruistic choice. No, it's just purely like... selfish. It would just make my, <laughs> make my job a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though you could teach like a whole troop of dogs and that would be an ama- to do silks and that would be pretty amazing. Oh my gosh. Um my my friend Sandra in Monterey, her uh-huh. dog her dog Uma will jump up and uh, grab her daisy chain silk in her mouth in Uma's mouth and then they will s- circle their hips back and forth and spin. So Stop. fast. I am not even joking you. Stop. Is that on Instagram somewhere? Because uh, I, <laughs> that fits both of my niches right there. Dogs <laughs> and aerials. So it's perfect. I know, right? I will, I know that there is video and I'll find it and send it to you. Oh my God, you're the best. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for chatting today, Brandon. You're welcome. Thanks, Shannon. That was my interview with Brandon Scott, acrobat. And he did wind up sending me the video of this dog. And it's amazing. If I can hunt it down again, I will try to post it on my new Facebook group, the Friends of the Artist Athlete podcast. Uh, If I can find it, I will put it there. And you guys can watch this amazing dog with amazing skills. That interview was so great. There was so much in it that I have to respond to. But I think what will help you guys the most is to look at what Brandon did to build his social media following. 
And three main things stuck out to me. He was consistent, he was generous, and he was true to himself first. Speaking to consistency, Brandon says he made a commitment to post once a day and only make aerial related posts. So he was consistent in his time frame, once a day, and in the content he posted. He wasn't just posting a French bulldog and then a picture of dirty laundry and then a video of him doing a star drop. No, he decided that all of his content or everything he made or posted would be the same. I think consistency is the biggest component of social media success, and it's also why some of the best acrobats I know don't have huge social media followings. They just don't want to post every day, or they want to use Instagram as a way to stay in touch with their friends while they're on tour. Likewise, there are definitely accounts I can think of that have huge followings, even though when I watch the videos, I'm like, who are you? And why are you posting that? And I know that sounds really shady, but you guys know the accounts that I'm talking about, and don't tell me you haven't thought the same thing. But These accounts exist, and they have a lot of followers and people who pay attention to them because they are consistent. I think the key to consistency is figuring out why you even want a social media following in the first place. And this is something that I didn't get to ask Brandon Scott Acrobat, and I wish I had, was why he started growing his Instagram account initially. I know for me personally, I grow my account because it's a free way to market things like this podcast or the online resources that I sell at theartistathlete.com. So it's a pretty strong why for me. And I think that, to be honest, if I didn't have that why, I wouldn't be on Instagram as much as I am because it's definitely a job and it definitely takes a lot of time and thought and energy into each day and each post that you make. Which leads to our second point of discussion, this idea of generosity or being generous with what you post. And this is such an interesting thing in the circus world. I remember reading on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, my friend Megan Gendel, who is a amazing trapeze artist and has a- another really great following. Um, she posted a similar question to the one I asked Brandon about safety and w- how much do you show if you're doing a drop or something that is dangerous but may not seem dangerous. And someone else posted underneath, you shouldn't be showing any of this. You should let students come to you and you should and they should pay you for the coaching and the training that you're giving them. Instagram isn't a place to learn skills. And while I absolutely agree that Instagram is not the place to give yourself an aerial class, the correct place to learn aerial or hand balancing or hand to hand partner acrobatics is with a good knowledgeable coach, not some hippie on the beach doing acro yoga. So she said this, and while I agree with the overall sentiment, I think that there is something problematic about being too close to the belt or too guarded with the information. Because if you've worked very hard and you have a bunch of information, if you don't show people, if you don't give them a taste of what you can do or what you know, no one will know that you know it. And so how can they benefit from it? How can they see your value or know that you're a trusted resource or someone they want to follow because you do cool things or say cool things or have cool things to share unless you're doing or saying or sharing those cool things. Again, going back to this podcast, even people all the time are like, God, Shannon, you put five hours into editing that podcast with Brandon Scott Acrobat and you're not getting paid for any of this, why are you doing that? And my answer is that eventually I will start a Patreon account and I will ask for people to lend their monetary support. But before I can ask for that, I have to give them something. I have to be generous with my time and my resources or else they won't be generous with theirs. And maybe it's 
a strategy or maybe it's a marketing ploy, but what a cool, great marketing ploy where everybody wins, right? <laughs> I mean, imagine if the leaders of the world solved their problems not by withholding things from each other, but by being generous. And before I go off on a too much of a tangent about that, let's talk about the very last point, which is this idea of pleasing yourself first. I asked Brandon, how does he change his performance based on his clientele or who he's performing for? And he was totally honest. He said, the first person who I try to make happy when I'm making an act or choreographing is myself. Brandon, though, takes a totally different approach to creating and developing his artistic voice. He's not an artist who goes off and secludes himself in a mountainous retreat and comes out with his new piece of art. He creates every day and he's instantly sharing what he makes with a sounding board of 50,000 collaborators. And he gets instant feedback as to what people like, what people don't like, but ultimately he has to like it. And I thought it was so cool how he said the process of making these posts, of filming himself over and over and over again and watching that really helped him create his personal taste. Of course, the social media collaboration route is not the way that all art should be made. Some artists need to go up on the mountain and come down with their new work of art. And we need those people just as much. There are people who don't want to share their process with the world. It can be hard for some people to practice in the same room as other people when they're running an act or training a skill for the first time. Again, if you want a social media following, you need a pretty strong why. And you need to accept the fact that thousands of people are going to be seeing your work every day and having their own thoughts and judgments about it. And so part of your why should incorporate what you want to do with those thoughts and judgments. Do you want to listen to people when they say, that looks really cool, you should try that, oh, that's weird? Or do those voices not matter? So three ideas for social media success, consistency, generosity, and pleasing yourself first which actually are pretty great ideas for success in any part of life, or love, or circus. If you like today's podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, whatever you're listening to this on. When you subscribe especially, but also rate and review, it tells the little robots over at the platforms that this podcast is awesome and they should do their part to promote it more. So thank you in advance for that. You can follow Brandon Scott Acrobat on Instagram if you're not already. His Instagram handle is Brandon Scott Acrobat. And I am at the underscore artist underscore athlete. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you next week.